Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you and uh, welcome to the Kahan Kerensky and Capicella webinar series on uh, state planning and long term care. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, in this unique time and uh, hopefully we'll uh, give you some information and some tidbits to take away from this series that you can use in your everyday lives. Uh, last week, we had Attorney Dakin, who spoke on wills and trusts and powers of attorney and uh, all of the other documents that are part of a traditional estate plan and some of the things that should be um, encapsulated within that. And some of these video segments are going to be available online on our website in a little bit, too. So I don't believe that's happened yet, but it will be soon. So if you missed last week, you can go back and attend them at some point. Uh, this week, I'm going to be giving you a general overview of long-term care, how to pay for the long-term care, what some of the options may be in regard to that. And then again, next week, we're going to have, uh, at the same time, we're going to have attorney Allison Porter discussing incapacity planning, the documents that are going to be needed for that, some of the strategies that you should consider um, in, in putting those documents in place too. So please join us again next week for that. Um, as I said, I'm going to talk this week about long-term care planning. And some of the things I'm going to cover today would be uh, a little bit of the differences between Medicare and Medicaid. That's a commonly misunderstood uh, or misused term, um, one used instead of the other. Uh, what's some of the, a quick overview of the Medicare options, which you know most people over the age of 65 are aware of at this point. Uh, overview of what some of the Medicaid options are, long-term care costs, what some of the Medicaid eligibility rules are, including the financial restrictions associated with them. And then finally, on the Medicaid side, getting a little bit into um, some of the application processes, some advice in that regard, and some of the common problems that we frequently see in regards to those applications. So just to kind of dive right in, Medicare versus Medicaid, uh, very close terms, frequently misused. Medicare is akin to your regular health insurance that you might have had through an employer. So it's going to assist for paying for your routine care, for repaying for hospitalization and specialized medical care, uh, where you may have, you know, prescription plans and co-pays and things like that. Medicaid is different. That applies when you're disabled um, and you also have no longer the assets to pay for your care. It is, is, is going to um, cover a situation where there is a disability, a long-term disability, um, and you don't have the means to pay for your care any longer. So Medicare, again, the hospitalization and the kind of routine insurance piece, um, it really has two components to it. <clears throat> Traditional Medicare applies when you're age 65, and that includes um, several parts. There's Part A, which covers your hospitalization and your rehab and your hospice. There's Part B, which covers your medically necessary routine care, your doctor's visits, uh, vaccinations, things like that. And then there's Part D, which covers prescription drugs. You can also acquire a Medigap insurance policy too, which you're going to privately pay for. This isn't going to be deducted out of the social security costs, which is a supplemental insurance that would cover things that the traditional Medicare wouldn't pay for. Um, sometimes it's called the donut hole coverage. The other option in Medicare, <clears throat> again, traditional health insurance, um, is to uh, purchase a Medicare Advantage plan, sometimes called Part C. And this really combines Medicare Parts A, B, and usually D, the prescription plan, um, and rolls it all up into one convenient plan for you. It's kind of like an HMO. Um, and it may also offer additional benefits that traditional Medicare may not, such as vision and dental, um, and even a prescription drug plan. So. For anybody in the, in the age 65 or over, I'd encourage you to review your current coverage 
and whether or not traditional Medicare makes sense for you or if a um, Medicare Advantage plan, a Part C plan, <clears throat> would be more beneficial for you. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> excuse me. So Medicaid, there's really two types of care options in Medicaid. Medicaid, um, which is also referred to as Title 19 for the um, federal statute that's involved with it, <clears throat> is long-term care needs for those who are disabled. And that can be either care provided in your home, or that can be care provided in a skilled nursing setting. Uh, <clears throat> and, and it's really those two pieces. Uh, many, many times I get asked the question, if I go to an assisted living facility, will Medicaid be available to pay for my care? <clears throat> and the answer is generally no, unless uh, that facility happens to accept Medicaid. And there are very few that do actually accept Medicaid. So when you're getting into your long-term care um, you're disabled and you're looking at care in a, something like a skilled nursing facility, the average cost for one month of care here in Connecticut is over $13,000. It's a pretty staggering sum. Um, you may be thinking about what your own financial situation looks like and saying, I don't have too many months of care to be able to pay for, <clears throat> which runs the question of how are you going to pay for your care? You could obviously use savings, accumulated assets uh, to privately pay at that number. You could also use uh, long-term care insurance. For those of you who haven't purchased or investigated long-term care insurance, you may want to do that. Uh, the products have changed significantly over in the last uh, five to seven years. Um, at one point, they were a pretty good deal. Um, now the pricing is appropriate for um, what the benefit is that's going to be provided, but it's really a risk reward situation for anybody in, in exploring it, but you should explore it. <clears throat> for anybody who works for a large employer, find out if your employer has a group long-term care product that you might be able to purchase and might be portable when you separate from that employer. Uh, oftentimes the pricing is very competitive and better than you may be able to get um, as an individual in the market. The other way to pay for your long-term care, if you don't have the savings, if you don't have the long-term care insurance, is to look for governmental assistance to pay for your care. A couple of uh, main programs would be veterans benefits. <clears throat> veterans benefits, um, I'm not going to get into detail today, but are for veterans um, and or spouses um, who served during the time of war. Um, Medicaid is the other governmental program that'll pay for your care if you're disabled. Title 19. So how do you get eligible for Medicaid? Well, first of all, just remember Medicaid is, is, is a welfare program designed to pay for the care of those who can't afford to. And there's two main components or two main requirements. One, the first is that you have to be disabled in accordance with the social security guidelines. And the second one is you have to have very limited assets in order to qualify for Medicaid. <clears throat> so the first piece is how are you determined to be disabled? So sometimes I get clients that come in and they may say, I need to go on Medicaid. I need somebody to pay for my care. And the question is, well, what kind of care do you need at this point in time? And the Medicaid standard or the Social Security Disability Guidelines are based upon how many functions or acti activities of daily living you can perform or not perform, such as bathing, dressing, um, continence, feeding, toileting, transferring, meaning getting up and out of your seat and so forth. So the fewer of those things that you can do, um, the greater the likelihood you will be considered disabled under the Social Security guidelines. Now, 
in looking at the two types of Medicare care that could be provided. One is home care, one is skilled nursing setting. In a home care setting, there's several levels of care, and that actually varies depending on how many of those activities of daily living you're capable of doing. So what happens is in the home care setting, um, a, a social worker would come out to your house and actually conduct a needs assessment to determine what the proper level of care is that you require. How much care you need also impacts the level of assets that you can keep and the amount of income that you can earn as well. So there are different categories depending on the severity of your disability from the home care perspective. For frail elders with one or two critical needs or that those activities of daily living who can't do one or two of those activities of daily living, um, <clears throat> there's actually a state of Connecticut funded program called the Connecticut Home Care Program for the Elderly. And under that program, there is no income limit um, and there's an asset limit of about $39,000 for an individual. If you get, if you have more than two, one or two critical needs that you can't handle yourself, then you're getting into what's called category three and above, which is this, the rules of traditional Medicaid apply here. So category three and above, even though it's home care, <clears throat> It's really care being brought in for somebody who would otherwise be in a nursing home if they didn't have this care in, in, at home. Most of the rules are same as traditional Medicaid. Um, there is an income limit of about uh, $2,300 a month. There's an <clears throat> asset limit, which I've mentioned before, about $1,600 per individual. Um, and then there are, are some spousal rules too where they can retain additional assets as well. So that leads us into the next component. So financial restrictions <clears throat> and the skilled nursing setting. In determining qualification, all of the assets of the individual and the individual spouse, if they're married, are going to be examined to determine whether or not you meet those qualifications. So what happens is they determine what is a countable asset for you and or your spouse, and what's not a countable asset. And the non-countable assets are gonna be called, <clears throat> excuse me, exempt assets or inaccessible assets. An exempt asset, um, to give you a few examples, is something like your home. <clears throat> is one, sorry, I keep uh, coughing here, but uh, we'll, we'll work through it. <clears throat> An exempt asset, like your home, as long as one, either you or your spouse can continue to reside in the home, it's going to be an exempt asset with equity up to about $900,000. So nobody is going to throw you or your spouse out of your house as long as you can continue to live there from a medical perspective. Exempt assets also include household furnishings, household belongings, <clears throat> your personal property, business property if you need it uh, for self-support. Uh, you can also prepay in an irrevocable funeral contract about $8,000. Um, vehicle is exempt as well and some other assets. So there's a whole host of things, um, kind of daily needs uh, types of assets that are exempt from the process. Inaccessible assets are, access, are assets that you don't have complete control over. <clears throat> For example, if you have a piece of real estate that you can't sell and it's deemed to be unmarketable, then it would deem to be inaccessible. You've tried to sell it, you can't sell it, it's inaccessible. Um, could also be if there's a jointly owned piece of property and the joint or co-owner refuses to sell it, and then it's deemed to be inaccessible as well. Or sometimes property is subject to uh, legal proceedings or claims and, and can't be sold either. <clears throat> now I mentioned joint assets. Joint assets to the extent you have them are going to be considered 100% available to the ill individual unless it can be proven otherwise. 
So the default position um, in a Medicaid application is if there's a joint account, it is all the assets of the sick individual. Now you can refute that and provide evidence of that, but that's typically done at an appellate level, not at the original application level. So for anybody with joint accounts, and I've had this situation where I had um, a son who, uh, who did a lot of traveling, he added mom to his accounts uh, just for convenience. Um, mom ended up going into a nursing home. They looked at all of those accounts and said, that's all mom's money, it's all available to her. Um, you don't wanna be in a position to have to refute that. So to the extent you wanted somebody to be able to handle your finances for you when you were away, um, consider getting a power of attorney drafted, have somebody <clears throat> go on your account as a power of attorney, not a joint owner instead. That way it eliminates that particular issue on the Medicaid side of things. So if you're married, what can your spouse keep? Um, very common question that I get. And your spouse can keep your exempt assets, such as your residence, uh, personal belongings, a vehicle, et cetera, the inaccessible assets. And then what they're gonna do is add up everything else. So whether it's cash in the bank, whether it's um, investments, um, retirement assets are in there too. And they're gonna determine how much do you have. And your spouse can keep the lesser of 50% of what that number is or a maximum of about $129,000. So it's a pretty, pretty low number given what some people are starting out with. So the question then becomes, well, what happens if you have more than that number? And the answer is, it's got to be spent down um, on things <clears throat> that are acceptable throughout the Medicaid process. So your assets will have to be spent to get down to the qualification for Medicaid on things like your actual care. So you may have to pay that bill of $13,000 a month for a period of time or for home care or whatever that is. You can also do certain things too. For example, if you're married and there's a spouse um, and you're staying at home, um, improve your residence. <clears throat> put in that new furnace, put in that new windows. Um, prepaying your funeral if you haven't already done it. Paying off debts is another valid way to spend down your money. Paying professional fees. Uh, to somebody like myself as an attorney or to an accountant or anybody like that. Um, those are all acceptable ways of spending down your money. There is the availability too to try and spend your money by converting it from an asset to an annuity, which means a future, future income stream. <clears throat> and on that conversion, we've now taken an asset from um, a countable asset and converted it into a non-countable asset. And that's a very specific strategy that I'm not gonna get into too much detail today, but we use very frequently. So one of the common things I get in, in kind of looking at the spend down is, can I make gifts to my kids or to anybody else in order to spend down the money? And the answer is yes, you can make these gifts, but how soon you need to apply for Medicaid um, impacts whether or not those gifts are going to be completed and stay the way they are. Because if you make a gift within five years of applying for Medicaid, um, the Medicaid uh, or Department of Social Services is going to impose a penalty on your situation for roughly each $13,000 that you gave away. So let's say you gave away $130,000 for each 13,000 that you gave away. So 130 divided by 13 is 10. That means for 10 months, you're not gonna be eligible for Medicaid. Now, keep in mind at the time this penalty is applied, you are out of money and in a nursing home. So who pays that $130,000? And that's where the, it becomes a little bit murky. Now, the options are, if you gave the money to the kids, they could return the money and you could pay your own way. And the theory behind the penalty is, from a Medicaid perspective, 
if you didn't give away the money, you could have paid for your care for another month or 10 in my example. So you, the, the gift can be returned by whoever you gave it to and essentially curing that gift and you would private pay during that penalty phase. Um, or if the, they don't have the money anymore, let's say they put in a new kitchen or they bought a boat or whatever it is, then you're in a situation of the nursing home isn't getting paid either by you privately or by Medicaid from a reimbursement perspective. <clears throat> so they're gonna actually sue the person who received the gift in that situation to try and recover it. So before you make any gifts, you need to carefully consider um, whether or not the gift's appropriate, whether or not you may need Medicaid within a five-year window, um, who you're giving it to, what the use is for, and to carefully plan there. This is one of the bigger planning aspects that we look at from a gifting perspective. <clears throat> and by the way, many people think that there's this rule out there that says I can give away ten or fifteen thousand dollars a year um, with no questions asked and, and, and nobody cares about that. And the answer is that's sort of true and that's true from a gift tax perspective. <clears throat> I can tell you with certainty if you give away fifteen thousand dollars and it's within five years of you applying for Medicaid they absolutely care if you gave away $15,000 because if you didn't, you could have paid for another month of your care. So that is a gift tax rule, not a Medicaid rule. Sometimes these rules don't go hand in hand. And if you take anything away from that, please take that away. The other thing to consider too, common question is, um, <clears throat> I, have, I have a piece of real estate, you know, it's worth let's say it's a vacant lot, it's worth $60,000. I'm going to transfer it to my son for $5,000. I'm going to sell it to my son for $5,000. Well, in that situation, what you've done is you sold it for five, but you've also made a $55,000 gift because it's fair market value was $60,000. That gift, if it's within the five year period of you applying for Medicaid, will incur a penalty. So the bargain sale element doesn't work either. So for each month that you incur a penalty, your care isn't being paid for. And we have to make sure that that's managed and somehow that care cost is being addressed or the penalty is being addressed or we cure it even before the application goes in. So the actual Medicaid application process, um, fairly detailed, and fairly lengthy. So the actual application is in excess of uh, 20 pages long. It's a different application for um, home care versus skilled nursing care. And there's, we have a checklist of about 18 items that we go through that, that people need to produce in order to qualify for Medicaid. So, and some, and some of the things aren't always what they would expect. We need you know, obviously IDs, but we need things like marriage licenses. Um, we need five years of financial records. And what I mean by that is for every account you have had in the five years prior to applying for Medicaid, we may need a monthly statement for each of those accounts. And this even includes accounts that you may have closed a year ago. So a year ago, you closed an account, we still may need four years of financial records for that particular account. So for those of you who are shredders or uh, manage everything online, I would encourage you to still maintain 60 months of paper because you may need it at some point in time in order to produce it for the Department of Social Services. Now, <clears throat> the rules that these things, um, and, you know, the five years, the numbers that were that I'm that I've you know kind of said about anything from the equity and the residence to the maximum that you can keep, these change frequently. Every six months to a year, um, they're going to change. So you need to be cognizant as to what those are. Um, most professionals will will have that information. The other thing is don't assume what worked for your neighbor or your aunt Edna in Florida is going to work for you. Whether that's a Medicaid strategy, whether that's an estate planning strategy, 
everybody's different. Everybody has their own facts and circumstances, their own family, their own finances, uh, their own states that they reside in. So please look at individual planning, not whatever somebody else did and say that works for me too. <clears throat> These rules differ from state to state on the Medicaid side, even though it is a federally uh, scripted program, it's administered by the states. So Medicaid qualification and rules in Connecticut look very different than they might in Massachusetts or Florida or any other state. Um, and, and what we're seeing now is the availability and the ability to get on Medicaid um, isn't, it, it's not a process that, that is getting smoother uh, day by day. It's actually getting more difficult day by day. And even in the COVID situation that we're in now, it's getting a little bit worse and additional delays. So what you wanna do is present an application <clears throat> to the Department of Social Services that is as neat and tidy and has answered all of the questions they may have ahead of time. And that's what we try and do for our clients. So some of the common issues that we see with applications are prior gifts. And we need to be able to explain what those gifts are um, to the reviewer. Maybe they were for a specific purpose, um, done for some reason other than trying to reduce the level of your assets. We also see applications that have incomplete records, um, have after discovered assets, meaning we figured out that you now own something after we've otherwise thought you were under the $1,600 uh, minimum or maximum threshold um, and have to address those. The other thing we see on the flip side, which is there are a lot of untrained reviewers at the Department of Social Services. So they may or may not understand the application that and fully that's coming through. And one of the things we try and do is educate them throughout the process to say, here's the issue we have, here's how it should be resolved um, under the rules and regulations and try and guide them along that process as well and make it as simple for them to give us an approval along the way. Um, the transactional side of this requires that we produce what's called a large transaction register. And we may have to produce and explain every single transaction in your finances um, that are over $5,000. And sometimes they, they drop that number lower to $1,000 or even lower than that. Um, so it's important that we have very complete records and a nice tidy application to put together for the reviewers at social services. So just kind of the, to wrap this up here and then I'll open it up for, for some questions is um, steps can be taken to protect your assets for you, for your spouse, uh, for your loved ones, whoever your heirs are. Um, the sooner you begin that process, typically the better. Remember, I keep mentioning this five-year look back um, on that. Um, to the extent you start the planning earlier, there are more options available to you. If you're within the five-year look back, there are still options available to you all the way up to the day that the application is filed. But the availability and number of options available to you definitely diminish if you're within that five-year window um, of looking at uh, possible gifting or other options. So plan now. Um, if you do have, you know, an illness that may produce um, at some point in time, uh, you know, particularly a skilled nursing setting or the need from home care or Medicaid, and, and a lot of these are, you know, the ALS, the, the MS, the Parkinson's, I'd encourage you to start planning very early uh, for the possibility that you may not be able to privately pay for your long-term care and you may need a Medicaid or some other government assistance program to pay for you. So um, that's kind of the conclusion for what I was going to discuss today. Um, if we have any questions, I can open it up to questions at this point in time. I think you'll see at the bottom of your screen, there's a little Q&A tab. If anybody wants to um, ask a question, they're welcome to at this point in time.
I'm just giving people a couple of seconds here if they want to type in a question. Um, so I have a question and the question is, is there a flat rate for filing a Medicaid application? The answer is no. Uh, the reason that we don't is because we don't know what we're getting into once we um, bring the client on. There could be prior gifts, there could be other issues that need to be explained and researched. Um, and we could have somebody that's got one bank account or somebody that's got 32 bank accounts and obviously there's a different level of work associated with it. You will find that um, many of the nursing homes will recommend uh, one or two companies to go get the Medicaid application done. Um, I'd strongly urge you to consult with a professional and attorney before engaging them and discuss whether or not there are merits to that. Um, the, the flat fee, and they will charge a flat fee by the way. Um, and what they're doing is they're preparing an application and all they're trying to do is submit it uh, the nursing home will get private pay as long as they can, and when you run out of money, then it'll go over to Medicaid from an approval perspective. The concern there is they're not trying to preserve assets for you, for your spouse, for your kids, um, and doing things that you might uh, otherwise be eligible for. They're not giving that information to you. So I had another question um, Regarding vener veteran benefits, um, does the same assets and income qualification apply? And the answer is no, it's a completely different set of rules. Um, traditionally though, if you're gonna be able to apply for Medicaid, it's a better benefit than it will be from a veteran's perspective, um, but it's a completely different set of rules. And veterans benefits, not only, I mean, there's a pension, there's a, there's, uh, the long, there is a long-term care piece of it as well, but um, very different setting and not really the topic of discussion today. Another question, have I seen Medicaid eligibility laws change often or they have been in place for quite a while? Um, well, well, as I indicated, the, um, a lot of the numbers change every uh, six months, every year um, with cost of living and so forth. Uh, the basic rule structure now has been in place for a while. Um, one of the big changes that happened was that used to, they used to look back three years on gifts um, and then they went to a five-year uh, transition or a five-year look back period. Um, but that, that happened more than 10 years ago now. So um, some of the rules do stay the same, um, but a lot of the processes do change quite frequently. Um, and it really is dictated by the legislature um, and by cost of living adjustments and other things as well. So I don't see any other open questions at this point in time. Um, I want to thank you for participating in our webinar series. And uh, please join us next week for Attorney Allison Poirier, who's going to discuss incapacity documents and those planning options. Um, thank you all. Have a um, great day and stay safe. Um, one other question that just came in, I'll just finish it up and is, um, is there an age you should start to look into long-term care insurance? And the answer is really no, there's no specific age. Um, and the reason I say that is if you look at your family history, if your family history has something like MS or Parkinson's or ALS in it, you may wanna get that long-term care insurance when you're in your 30s and 40s if you think you may have, a, have, have that situation. Um, but for the most part, for people that don't have that history, they're usually starting to look at it in their mid-50s, probably